Hi, I'm Doug and welcome to the School of Guac. I grew up in Texas eating and cooking with my family and fell in love with Tex-Mex super early. My mom's a self-taught cook and she taught me to love learning and I love learning about food and cooking. I never went to traditional culinary school. Instead, my professors were my mom, Alton Brown and Chef Jacob. In 2009, I was the best teen chef in the Dallas metro area. During college, I cooked with a Southwest cuisine expert named Chef Peter Madden. After I graduated from Texas A&M University, I moved to North Carolina to chase my dream. There, I cooked with incredible chefs like William Disson. I cooked whole hog barbecue, opened critically acclaimed restaurants, and even catered weddings in castles. Now, I'm in New York, and I'm thrilled to announce that you've all been accepted to the School of Guac. On this show, I'm gonna teach you new skills and a new perspective using the food that I love. And after each lesson, you'll all be better cooks and you'll have food to share with people that you love. Today, I'm cooking several recipes inspired by the food that I cooked growing up with my mother. Roasted red salsa, creamy chicken and green chili enchiladas, and horchata. And she even sent me some chilies direct from Dallas, Texas for me to use today. So, let's get started. This is grapeseed oil. Might start from the front. Okay, so does hand. I'm not gonna do anything to, in my world. We want a tight seal. Lime juice, as always, again, oven. And you can roll leftover from our miso pasta for salsa. We did all to take a spatula, just of sugar, in, through the strainer. Okay, so to start, we're gonna talk about miso pasta. Miso pasta is the cook's mantra in the kitchen. Translated literally from French, it means everything in its place. But it goes a lot further than just ingredients like you see here. It starts here in your head. As you're approaching the kitchen and you're starting to create some magical deliciousness for your loved ones, I like to start at the end. Where am I gonna put my finished project? For example, today we're making salsa. My first thought is what am I gonna serve the salsa in? I'm gonna go grab that and bring that over. And I have that set aside. And I go through, I'm gonna need my blender. So I've got my blender ready. I'm gonna need all my seasonings, my salt. And as I work forward, we've got our ingredients like cilantro, onions prepared, garlic prepared, jalapenos, and tomatoes. All ready, tomatoes are opened and drained. Everything is ready to go. And then we can begin. And so normally, we would start and dice our onions, prep our uh, jalapenos by taking the stem off. I like to leave them whole to roast, but you can also cut them in half and take the seeds and stems out if you prefer it a lot milder. I don't, I like it spicy. On the topic of tomatoes, if you live in a place that it's peak season, late July, August, you know where a farm is that has plump tomatoes coming off the vine and they're perfect 100%, go to that place and get as many of those as you can. Most people don't. And you like salsa generally every single day of the year. So I like to use canned, whole, fire roasted tomatoes that I've drained. Usually no salt added if you can. We like to add our own salt, but that's not always possible, so it's okay. Which goes into one of our concepts of we're gonna be tasting all the time. Tasting everything, adjusting as we go, because you don't wanna add salt all at the end, and you wanna make sure everything's tasting really, really good. So, to start, we're going to have our onions, jalapenos, and garlic in a bowl. In we go. And we're gonna to toss this with just a little bit of neutral oil. When I say neutral oil, I mean absolutely not a flavored oil like extra virgin or sesame or something in that realm. We want something high temp like this. This is grapeseed oil, my personal favorite. We're just gonna to toss this up with our garlic like this. And we've got a sheet tray and we're just gonna fire this straight on here. And this goes into a ripping hot oven. If you don't have a broiler, just turn it as high as it could possibly go. If you do have a broiler, we're gonna use a broiler. In the meantime, we're gonna get the rest of our mise en place ready. In this case, it's going to be our cilantro. Cilantro is magical stuff, but not everybody likes cilantro. There's actually a gene that some people had that makes this literally taste like soap which is truly, truly terrible and you have my sympathies. If you don't like cilantro, absolutely you can use parsley. It will taste a little different. It'll taste a little bit more Mediterranean, but still delicious. You can also use oregano. It's also a really, really good herb. We don't want to necessarily pick 
just the leaves off and ruin this plant. We want to wash it and then typically we'll just kind of bundle it up like this. We'll take a very sharp knife and we'll start from the front and just work our way just cutting in one direction all the way down through the majority of the stem. Cilantro stem tastes just like cilantro so we don't need to take this off but this big thick stuff don't really necessarily want. You can slice this up really thin and use it as a nice garnish, delicious. Or put it in the garbage. So we're gonna reserve this and we're gonna finish our salsa with this whenever our peppers, onions, and garlic come out. We're gonna use our bench scraper that we always have close at hand. Make sure everything is neat and tidy. We're always cleaning, making sure everything is organized. And now we can get started on another piece of our mise en place for our next dish, our creamy chicken and green chili enchiladas. I've got some really amazing hatch chilies, which are only in season for a couple months of the year from New Mexico. I got these from my mother in Dallas. We're gonna give these the exact same treatment as our salsa mise en place. So we're just gonna give a little bit of that neutral oil, not make a mess. We're gonna give it another tasa tasa. And the oil for in both cases is to encourage something called the Maillard reaction, which is just that browning, which is where a lot of that really good flavor comes from. If you don't add the oil, it won't brown as easily. It won't get nice and crusty and flavorful. So we want this. And don't worry about the calories. It's not that big of a deal. And then we're gonna do the same exact process here. Toss those on a sheet tray, just like this. And then we're gonna put it in the oven when our friends come out of the broiler. And then as we wait for this to come out, we've got our blender. If you don't have a blender, totally fine. You can use a food processor, also works well. If you don't have a food processor or a blender, then I would not use whole tomatoes. What I would do is get fire roasted crushed tomatoes. And then once everything comes out, chop it up by hand and mix it all together and you're squared away there. I like a blender because I'm a little lazy. So we're gonna put our tomatoes in here that have been drained. And you'll see you drain them and they're still full of juice. So we want the juice, we don't want to crush them, but we don't want all the juice from the can. And we'll put these in there, like so. We'll add our cilantro. I like to add most of the cilantro, but not all the cilantro, because I like to add a little bit in in a little bit bigger pieces later on. We're gonna add a little bit of our ground cumin, which is magical stuff. It's got this really nice earthy, smoky flavor, underrated seasoning, delicious. Um, not the oil, neutral oil. A little red wine vinegar. A little honey. In we go. And then we're gonna add a little bit of salt here to start. We want the salt incorporated. We know that this needs salt. We don't have to worry about adding too much at this point. I usually add, I measure with fingers. So we've got a one finger, two finger, three finger pinches of salt. I like to add just a two finger, obviously a thumb is not a finger, but that's incorporated. Two finger pinch into the blender. And then we're going to add in our lime juice and our roasted veg in wholesale. Okay, so our veg is ready. We're gonna yank that out of the oven real quick into the blender. This is very hot, so don't touch this with your hands. Another essential tool is an excellent rubber spat. I really like these unibody spatulas, all silicone, high temp. The ones with wood handles get moldy and nasty. They hide gunk inside the handle. These are the king, always use something like this. And then you'll notice I love it spicy. I'm a huge chili head. I'm not gonna do anything to these poor jalapenos. They go in whole, just like this. But like I said, at home, if you really are averse to the, to the heat, to the capsaicin, then take it out. Once it's cool, you can actually just peel these with your hand, no problem. And everything kind of just slurps right out of the pepper, easy peasy. So boom, that's that. We're gonna throw his friends back in there with him. We'll throw the lid on there like that. Now your blender typically has a bunch of different settings. Professional kitchens, generally you will have a on switch and a dial. Here, we're just gonna go more or less to all the way. 
which is gonna be a ice crush situation and or a pulse, which is gonna be here. So, off we go. We don't wanna juicify everything. So we might take our spatula, kinda jam everybody in there. We want everybody to get to know each other. She'll catch up, she'll catch up. You really want everything to kind of start vortexing, which is that sort of whirlpool effect that will incorporate everything really well. But like I said, we don't want to liquefy. So this is done. This is, we're ready to go here. What we want to do is we want to taste, like we said. We're just going to grab a little bit, clean spoon, just a little smidge. And I have to say, that is delicious. We're going to take a little bit of lime juice, fire that in there, because we want that nice, citrusy brightness, which is essential to Tex-Mex and Mexican cooking. In Mexico, traditionally, they use something called either a lime, which is called a limon, or a Seville orange, which is an, a type of orange that's green, that's kind of bitter and sour, oh, and so, so good. So you can do something like that. I like to use sometimes a blend of juices, grapefruit juice, orange juice, lime juice, all together. It gives a really, really nice flavor. One of these here into a bowl like that. Just give it a little incorporation and we'll grab a second spoon. Definitely not that same spoon or you can wash it. Taste one more time. Fire, delicious, perfect. And that is literally my favorite food. This and then one other key component which is traditionally called a totopo or a corn chip. But I found that while I do love all chips, all chips have a home in my world. But what I think is a really cool treat that you don't really see very often is going to be a flour tortilla chip. I think it's something special about it, like maybe a little indulgent. It's got a cool little texture, cool flavor. So I think that's what we're gonna do today because we already have flour tortillas for our enchiladas. So this is just an easy, we're just going to cut it in half, stack them up, and then just cut it into sections. And then we just have a bowl, and we're gonna give the same treatment too. A little there, again, a little bit of neutral oil, just a little bit, because we don't want them to be greasy, but we do need, again, that Maillard reaction. We want that browning, so we need the oil to help with that. And then just gently, with our hands, kind of like salad tongs, we're gonna go in and just kind of give it a little, a little toss a toss a little, you know, a little massage and just kind of get everything nice and coated uh, like that. And then we're gonna grab another sheet tray or the same sheet tray because there's no issues with bacteria or any weirdness with this. This is, they're happy to be together. And then we'll just throw these on here and we're gonna do this just in like, to the best of our ability, a single layer. We want them to not be stacked on top of each other and, and getting in everybody's way because we want these super nice and crispy. So there we go. Lay them out in a single layer, just like that. This is too many. We'll cook these in a second batch. Just like this. And then we'll put this into a 350 degree oven until they're nice and crispy, like so. And then we're going to take them out, out of the oven, season with some salt, and then straight into the pool. And that's it. Easy peasy. Roasted red salsa, one of my personal favorites. One important thing to remember about this salsa is the technique. Taking the fresh veg and adding flavor by building that Maillard, that caramelization, that browning, you can apply that with a bunch of different varieties. We've got tomatoes here. You take green tomatillos, which is uh, like a ground cherry, delicious. Do the same process as the rest of the veg with the tomatillos. Leave the tomatoes out, in we go. Then you've got a salsa verde, a green salsa. Super good. Tomatillos are really, really bright. Really, really good with chicken. Would make an excellent sauce for our enchiladas. You can leave the tomatillos out and do even pineapple. You don't necessarily need the roasted pineapple, but you can. Same exact ingredients, but with pineapple. Then you got like a nice, bright, fruity salsa. So good. So remember this methodology and take it and adapt for it. And this is how you'll become a better cook is by taking recipes, taking parts that you can reapply as you go forth. And that's how we learn to be set free. Mise en place sets you free, technique sets you free. 
and that's what I want for all of you out there. Our next thing is going to be our creamy chicken and green chili enchiladas. We're going to take our chilies out of the oven, throw them in the bowl, and wrap them with plastic wrap so they steam. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to creamy chicken and green chili enchiladas. Our first step is gonna take our chicken breasts. It's important to get, spend money on chicken. Lots of factory raised chicken is horrifying and chewy and it's bad for the chickens. So get good chicken, please. Into the water, we've got boiling water here. In we go. And we're just going to cook that chicken in the boiling water. We don't want a rolling boil. We just want a gentle simmer until it's just cooked through. And then we'll pull our chicken out into a bowl. And then we're gonna shred the chicken up. I did this by hand. While it's still hot, you can take two forks and just go Wolverine on it and just ah, shred it up and it'll be really nice. So we've got that. Our next step is we're gonna take our chilies out of the oven that are gorgeous. We're gonna throw those into a bowl like that and we're gonna take some plastic wrap and cover it up. And this is going to cause, we want a tight seal, and this is gonna cause the peppers to steam and as they steam, the skin, the very fine layer of skin on the outside of the meat of the pepper will actually separate and you can take the skin off inside the pepper, you'll open it up, there's veins inside the pepper as well as seeds, all that is gone. You don't want to chew any of that. And it ends up looking pretty similar to this once you peel it, seed it, and dice it up. And so that's what we want. So our mise en place, we've got our shredded chicken, prepped peppers, we've got small diced onions, garlic, chili powder, cumin, and some more neutral oil. What we're going to do next is we're going to go to a hot pan, saute pan. I like to have the pan hot and then you take oil add it to the hot pan that will avoid the sort of skin that can form with oil that gets too burny or cook too long so we've got hot oil and then we've got our sliced garlic we've got our diced onion we've got our chilies and everybody everybody in the pool all at the same time even the spices because we want the spices to bloom as they saute and we're ripping hot. As we're working on that, we can take our chicken, we've got our chicken, we've got sour cream, sour cream in, we've got cream cheese, full fat cream cheese. No cheating on the cream cheese. We're already, we're, we're in too deep already. Don't skip here. In we go. Most of it we can add to adjust consistency as we go. A little lime juice as always. Again, back to the salsa point. If you've got some fresh grapefruit and some orange and some lime, throw it all in there. It's all super good. We just want that bright acidity because we want balance in all things as we go through. As we're thinking about the flavors on our tongue, we want balance. We want saltiness, a little sourness, a little acidity, which we're getting from our citrus. Um, a little bitterness doesn't help. Bitterness comes from, you know, leftover burny skin parts from the peppers. All of that creates a really nice balanced flavor profile in your mouth, which is what we really, really want to happen. And so as we saute our peppers and our onions and all our friends here, we want to cook that down into some magical goodness. And what ends up happening once you add that in is you've got like a very soft paste with everything in it. So we're gonna take that and we're gonna combine that with our friends here. Everybody again in the pool. Boom. Last thing, a little kosher salt. Always using kosher salt. You don't need to cook with iodized salt unless you're, you know, an 80 year old ailing person that needs the iodine in your diet. Otherwise, leave it out. Just do kosher salt. And then this is a really fun part. You can take a spatula and you can mush it around and combine everything. You should do that. 
Or what I like, what I've always liked, boom. Best, best tools for this kind of job right here. Washed hands. And then we go into the bowl. And we're just gonna combine everything really nice. It's okay to break the chicken up into like much smaller pieces. Honestly, I've found that the finer the chicken is, it incorporates better with everything else. And it ends up being a lot nicer texture when it comes out of the oven. One thing you can do here is take some of our uh, roasted red salsa. You can fire this into there. If you ended up making some green salsa, salsa verde with the tomatillos, you could also throw that in here. If you don't have salsa around that you made and you've got some in the fridge or some favorite hot sauce or any of those kinds of things, remember, just again, think about the technique that we've got going on here and then just adapt to what you've got. You don't need to, you know, stay on the rails like some kind of terrible uh, robotic cooking train. So, hands are nasty. Wash the hands real quick. If you've got gloves, I usually will throw on a pair of gloves at this point for this process so we can just say adios to those bad boys whenever we're done so you don't have to wash your hands as much. But you can just wash your hands. So there we go. This is what our base looks like right here. What we want to do real quick is just get a little taste of ruski. Just a little piece. Make sure you've got a little bit of everything because we want to make sure that we've got that roundness. Super good. Probably just a little bit more salt. And I'm not gonna wash my hands again, so we'll just grab this spat and just give it a little mixy. And you'll notice these are different colors. What I ended up using was a nice blend of different peppers. Again, we're not sticking so straight to the recipe. We've got poblanos, cubanelle, jalapenos all together that we've mixed in here. So, next step is flour tortillas. So the brand doesn't really matter as much. I try not to go for the big box brand as much. They can have weird flavors and what I really would like is a nice quality brand of flour tortilla or corn tortillas. If you like corn, the flavor of corn a lot more. You can take some corn tortillas, fry them briefly in oil to make them much more pliable and then you can roll them up. In this case, we'll use the flour. Flour is already very, very pliable. We'll take our mix. I've got a casserole dish here and our tortillas. And I like to start with some kind of uh, receptacle here to keep things clean. We'll take a tortilla. We'll take, I would say that you want about a half a cup of mix per tortilla. You can do fewer enchiladas and stuff more in them. <laughs> cool, do whatever you want, that sounds great. If you have smaller tortillas, obviously you'll use less mix. And we'll fire those in there. And you'll see here, let me make it a little bit better. What we're doing is we're putting in our filling. We've got our tortilla here. And we're gonna take this and kind of really bring this in like you're doing a sushi roll or making a burrito or something. Really tuck that in. And you can roll that up really nice and tight. And then, boom right into our new home, just like that. And then we're just gonna rinse and repeat as we go through. That one had a little, lacked a little bit on the filling, so we'll go in a little bit more, like this. And it's just like that, just rinse and repeat over and over again, nice and tight. You don't want it gushing out the sides. As it cooks, it'll melt and it'll fill in these side gaps there. That cheese and stuff will get out and get nice and crispy in this pan. So we're just gonna fill these up we're gonna cover this in foil into a 350 degree oven and we'll cook everything together. Everything will get nice and juicy together. It'll end up being about 20 minutes. When you pull them out, tortillas should be nice and crispy. And I like to take some cheese, fire the cheese on top, and you're ready to go to town. Traditionally in my household, what we would do is proceed to just eat every single one at that point. Usually split half and half between my brother and I. Uh, but you do whichever, whatever you would like. Probably not that much. Okay, so now we're gonna finish off our enchiladas. They've been in the oven at 350 for in the ballpark of 20 minutes, give or take. Depends on your oven again and how done you like it. We've got nice browning. This, this will be nice and crispy, like our chips. 
I like to finish off with a heaping helping of cheese. This is cotija, which is a traditional style of Mexican cheese. It's absolutely delicious, a little salty, a little funky, creamy, so good. I like to put too much on and then finish off with our favorite herb, a little chopped cilantro, left over from our misa pasta for salsa. We did it all at the same time, plenty of that. And then you can either serve limes on the side or honestly, I like to just hit it now. And that way it doesn't provide any kind of barrier for people when they're ready to go to town for dinner. And there you go. Creamy chicken and green chili enchiladas. One of my all time favorites and one that my mom used to make with me all the time growing up. So I look forward to everyone trying this. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to my second favorite drink of all time, which is a traditional Mexican agua fresca called horchata, which is a sweet and cinnamony rice milk. You're gonna love it. All right, and so we'll begin our horchata now. Incredible stuff, very easy. So we've got our blender again. We're gonna take some white long grain rice, cheap stuff, doesn't have to be fancy, not arborio, not sushi rice, just like plastic bag long grain rice into the blender, carefully, without spilling. We've got some blanched almonds. These are almonds that have been cooked in boiling water briefly to peel and are vaguely cooked, but they're not roasted, they're not salted, just plain almonds. In we go. No skin, but you can use the skin if you really want to. I've got some ground cinnamon here, in. And then we've got just a little bit of salt. That was sugar. In we go, salt with everything. Everything needs salt, all desserts, everything. And then we're going to destroy this into a powder. You wanna use the ice crush method. It's gonna go at a speed that will allow it to actually incorporate everything. We might need to take a spatula. Just give it a little stir here just to make sure all of our nuts and everything are properly pulverized. That looks great. If you've got a really powerful blender, it'll do short work of this, no problem. And then we'll take this we're gonna put it into a secondary bowl here briefly, just to make sure we can get everything out. Just like this, our trusty rubber spat is always close at hand. I've got certain tools that are always close at hand because you need to be able to move smoothly from one step to another. We're done with that, we can set it aside. And from here, it's super easy. We've got our powder and we've got four cups of water here. We're just gonna incorporate these bad boys together like that. Everybody in the pool. We've got two thirds of a cup of sugar in, just like that. Vanilla extract in. And then we've got two cups of whole milk. If you're lactose intolerant or you prefer to go dairy free, whatever milk makes you happy is great. Coconut milk actually works really, really good. Coconut and rice are actually a match kind of made in heaven. You can use Almond milk, really whatever makes you happy works great here. I like whole milk, so we're gonna use whole milk. In we go. And from there, we're just gonna give it a really quick stir, just to incorporate all of our friends here. Just like that. Hands off. Into the refrigerator. Overnight, uh, at least eight hours, but overnight is fine. But I'm not gonna wait overnight, because I already did and I've got some of this incredible finished product here for you. We're gonna give it one last stir just to get all of our flavors back in there together. I've got a fine mesh strainer here. It's very important that you have a very fine mesh, not a colander, not a basket sieve, fine mesh strainer. This is called a chinois. If you don't, you can absolutely use a basket strainer or a colander with a couple layers of cheesecloth, or if you really need, a tea towel will work, but you'll need to put it in there and really work it to go through. I'm lucky enough to have a fine mesh strainer, so that's what we're gonna use. 
And then here we go. We're just gonna take this. In we go through the strainer. It'll be clumpy. That's why we have our rubber spatula here. And we'll use our rubber spatula to encourage everything through. We wanna get everything out of there. Uh oh, leaking a little bit. Because this has still got nice flavor. Just like that. And then we'll just take our fine mesh strainer here and just encouraging everything through. And I'm taking my strain, my spatula and just pressing along the walls of the strainer to get all that fine particulate out of the way to allow the liquid to pass through. Just like that. You can give it a couple of squeezes to really encourage everything out of there. Once that's through, just like that. Always cleaning, sometimes we make a mess, but we just have a side towel close at hand. And then, boom, horchata. Make no mistake, this is one of the most delicious beverages ever made by humans. I like to pour it over some ice if you want, but if you keep it chilled like I did, it comes out just nice and cool like that. And you can see the color, you can see the cinnamon and the almonds and the rice. Yeah, it's really good. You absolutely have to drink this for yourself to understand. This is an incredible way to finish off the meal that we've been working on today. It is creamy, it's sweet, so it kind of satisfies that dessert craving, but it's refreshing. You can drink a whole glass first, you can drink a whole glass, glass at the end, and then later at night, you can take a little uh, vodka or tequila, that's a great adult beverage at the end of the night, just like that. Man, I'm excited. I'm going to drink all this myself right now. And there we go. That's what we've got for you today. Thank you all so much for joining me on the School of Guac. I want to see y'all's pictures of your salsas, enchiladas, and horchata. So send them to me on Twitter and Instagram at Doug E. Fresh, like creme fresh. If you have any questions about today or suggestions for the future, send me those too. And you don't want to miss the next episode because we're going to go in depth on the essential tools of the job and we're going to make the most delicious and iconic Tex-Mex casserole of all time. We'll see you then. Adios.